morning, welcome. Thank you. Sorry, I have people moving showings around on me. Speaking of which, Erin, if uh, I can't move this showing request on Goshen on Saturday, oh, never mind. He did it. Um, hold on. Let me put in my showing request here. So I had a listing appointment in Truesdale this morning. Woo! <laughs> the guy wants way for more, way more for his house than it's worth, of course. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and I got a speeding ticket on the way there. Sorry, I'm running behind. I'm not in the best mood. So I'll try to, you guys always make me happy. So um, I'll try to snap out of it. Um, how's it going? Good. Yeah? Awesome. Anyone have any off markets they want to share? No? Okay. <laughs> I need off markets. I have buyer needs. I need Brentwood condos. I actually have a house in Beverly Hills that belongs to a friend of ours. It's not on the market yet. He's working on it as we speak. And um, he may want to put it for 3.7 uh, in Beverly Hills. It's north of Sunset, but he doesn't want like anyone to really, unless there's a serious fire, he doesn't want anyone to uh, approach him yet. Okay. Um, he um, has been speaking with another agent, but he said that he might call it with me as well. That's great. That's great. Um, so would you like your information, please, Nagar, your email address, your contact info in the chat box, please? Yeah. Of course. What I'm doing is I'm driving now, but I'm going to go ahead and put my name and cell phone number and email in just a moment. Thank um, you. But it is in the city of Beverly Hills, so you get the protection of the Beverly Hills, you know, police, fire, the good schools, and all of that, which is a huge bonus. Great. I do have a need. Thanks. Uh, mostly I was asking because I wanted to ask about my need. <laughs> what do you need, George? If I need a three bedroom, uh, one to two bath with a detached scratch in Long Beach, um, anywhere. Why are you asking for Long Beach on this channel? <laughs> you never know. I mean, you never know. All right. Life is full of surprises. All right. Anyone else need anything before I start? No? Okay. All right. So today we're going to talk about how to make your buyer offer more competitive. How many people are writing buyer offers now? Hands? Yeah. How many people, how many are in multiples? Pretty much all property is in multiples, not every single one, but almost all of them. Um, so, you know, the last couple offers I've written, there were like 14, 15 offers. So uh, this is a really relevant class right now. We're going to talk about some of the things you can do outside of the contract first to make your buyer offer uh, more attractive. And then we're going to talk about the things that we're going to do contractually. Um, and some of the tips and tricks you might be able to use depending upon your buyer situation. All right, so first and foremost, um, if the listing agent was present when your buyers were at the property, there's this whole school of thought that buyers should not show their interest or enthusiasm about a property to the listing agent. That is completely false. If I am the listing agent, if anyone is the listing agent, um, I wanna know that the buyers love the house. And if I'm the buyer's agent, I am advising my buyers to be extra chatty and bubbly with the listing agent and make sure that listing agent knows that they love the house. I would like for the listing agent to remember my client's names and connect with the listing agent at least a little bit, if at all possible. I wanna to try to do the same thing with the listing agent, right? So um, before I write an offer, I am calling the listing agent and I am asking who their escrow and title is and if the seller needs anything specific um, so that I can write that into my offer. I'm verifying the seller's names so I get that right um, because the better, the cleaner my offer is, you know, that's a, a non-monetary way for me to make the listing agent and sellers uh, more amenable and open to receiving an offer from us is by making sure my offer is clean and well-written um, with all of the considerations taken in um, from the get-go. Uh, what else, guys? 
proof of funds. So a proof of funds you're going to need from the buyer. And in all honesty, um, I get a question all the time from buyers asking, hey, if I only need to put 100000 down and I show a bank statement for 300000 is that bad? No, it's not bad. I think it's good. So the more money your buyer can show to the listing agent and sellers, the more solid your buyer looks. All right. Um, you're going to need a pre-qualification letter. And when you're in a super multiple or super competitive multiple offer situation, like we're discussing right now, it's going to be important for you to reach out to your client's mortgage broker or lender and ask them to reach out to the listing agent via email or via um, phone call or text or something. It's just that extra step. It says my mortgage broker or my lender is really involved and active and basically lends to the credibility that we're going to close on time. Okay. Um, another thing we can do, and I do recommend doing, there's some controversy about it, is the buyer love letter to the seller. So NAR or CAR, sorry, CAR is discouraging seller, uh, the buyer writing uh, letter to the seller um, because the uh, California Association of Realtors is concerned about sellers being discriminatory towards a buyer because of something they read or something that they see in a photo. Um, I haven't personally experienced much of that in my career. Um, oh, Nagar just put her contact info into the chat box, guys, if you guys wanted that. Um, so I haven't experienced much of that. Um, would I discourage, you know, I might discourage photos if I feel like they're too intimate or um, not the best representation. You know, there's a, a great workaround for that. And the workaround is don't include a photo. Okay, so if you don't include a photo, uh, could that hurt you? I guess it possibly could. So this is, uh, at, you would ask your buyer, are they comfortable with it? And you would tell them, you know, what the advantages are and what the possible disadvantage is. Um, I, like I said, I haven't experienced much bad with it. I still encourage my buyers to include a photo with the letter. And the letter is gonna comprise of basically the buyer telling the seller, flattering them about their home. And um, like there's three sections. One is the flattery to the seller. Two is the, uh, you know, the composition, telling them about themselves. Is the buyer like, um, what's the word? Resume, buyer resume, I call it. Um, is it really a resume? No, but here's where the buyer tells the seller about themselves and their family. Um, and then section three is uh, the buyer telling the seller about, you know, the fairy tale life they envision for themselves there, like what that life looks like for them if they were given the opportunity to purchase the home. Okay. So those are the three parts of the love letter. And then if you want to, and you don't think it is going to hurt the buyer's chances and they're comfortable with it, including a photo. You said, you said, what was the first part? Uh, flattery. Flattery. Flattery, resume, future. Female come here, or fairy tale. Flattery, <laughs> resume, fairy tale. Female come here. Little dog. The one time I'm asking for my dog during class and she doesn't come. Where are you? Bima, I'm gonna show you guys something. Bima, come here. Little dog, little dog. Where are you? Treaty? You want a treaty? Yeah, you want a treaty? Okay, I have a treaty for you. Come here. Come here. Come here. Come here. Are you okay, sweetheart? Okay, she just fell. All right, so if I'm sending a letter of my buyers, I'm cute, right? But aren't we cuter? Okay, so if we're cuter, uh, I do highly encourage pets in buyer love letter photos. Are you okay, little dog? She just fell, so I'm gonna make sure she's okay. Are you okay? Are you okay? You wanna say hi to everyone? Say hi to Erin. Say hi. So hey, our, our, our seller love letter, much fun, much more fun, Beams. Thanks. Yeah, um, that makes sense. Yeah. 
So, um, yeah, it should be emotional. Um, if you have an angle to work, as long as your buyer's comfortable with it, you can work it. Uh, one of the examples I like to give in um, this class, uh, but I don't have it prepared because I was running late, is I had a buyer who was purchasing a duplex. And uh, the duplex was intended so that the sister of the wife, so the husband and wife purchasing, the sister of the wife with her two disabled daughters can move in in the back house so that they could provide support to them, but still have the privacy and separation necessary for the sisters. Uh, and so I put that into the letter um, and I was careful, you know, very careful about the way I worded it. But, you know, like I had a really strong emotional ploy case to plead why this home was perfect. And so, um, you know, we ended up with the property because we were the best price, but I still think if we weren't, we would have gotten a counter versus maybe them going with someone else, just because that's a pretty compelling reason, a pretty compelling letter. So you never know. If you have something extra, that might be the difference between you getting a counter offer and ultimately ending up with the property or not. But again, your buyer has to be comfortable with this. Um, sorry. Or if you're a cat lover, this is Molly. Would you prefer, <clears throat> prefer kitty cat picture? Mm -hmm. okay. Cute. <laughs> Thanks. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I get called Dr. Doolittle. I only, I have two cats and a dog, but apparently it's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's talk about now some contractual stuff. Okay, we're showing a lot of money. We're showing a solid proof of funds. We're asking the mortgage broker lender to call. Uh, we're writing a love letter. We're calling the listing agent, making sure we have all of the terms for a beautiful, clean offer. And then let me pull up a copy of the contract so I can show you some contractual stuff. So a lot of people on this call today. Okay. The graphic worked. Oh, it did, did it? Yeah. Um, Alfredo. Yes. The screen sharing is disabled. And thank you for the graphic. One second. Okay. You're good. Great, thank you. All right, guys, can you see this? Yes. Great. Okay. Um, seller counter offer. We're going to skip over the counter offer. We're going to talk about some things in the contract that can make your buyer offer more attractive. All right. So, guys, the shorter a close is, typically, of course, sometimes a longer escrow is what a seller wants. And you know these things because you've called the listing agent before you started writing your offer. Um, but typically shorter is more attractive. So, you know, pr probably 30 day escrow if your buyer has a loan is the shortest amount of time you can do. If your buyer needs longer, uh, good luck with that one. You might have to advise your buyer to pay more to offer more money if they want a longer escrow. And you might want to convey, oh, my client is offering, you know, an extra amount of money because they do need a longer closing. And then you're probably gonna to need to explain the reason why. Okay. Um, hold on just a second. Okay. Let's see here. Uh, you can always increase the buyer's initial deposit to make the offer more attractive. Our industry standard is 3%, but you might want to offer more. Or an increased deposit where a certain amount of days into escrow or after a certain contractual action, like maybe lifting the physical inspection contingency, they add uh, some more deposit funds at that point in time. Now, I want you to know the difference between these. And an earnest money deposit 
That's the amount of money that is typically up for grabs in the case that a buyer lifts all of their contingencies but fails to close the escrow. Whereas an increased deposit can just be a deposit that is not up for grabs or if, they, if you include car form RID can be up for grabs by the seller in the case of the buyer lifts all their contingencies and fails to close. Okay, so those are the two differences there, but adding some additional earnest money deposit or increased deposit funds can make the offer more attractive. All right. Um, let's see here. You're going to want to talk to your buyer's lender, but the shorter appraisal and loan contingency you can offer, the more attractive that's going to be to a seller. Keep in mind that an appraisal can't probably can't be done any shorter than 10 days. And a loan contingency, probably in all honesty, 17 days is the shortest a, a, a lender can do. But again, you're talking to your buyer's lender about these things. Just know that the shorter they are, the more attractive that is to a seller. Now, on a very rare occasion, where my buyer is a very qualified borrower, I might discuss with their mortgage broker or lender, hey, is it safe to do an offer with no loan contingency? And that sounds a little crazy, right? Because your buyer has a loan. So how can you do no loan contingency? Well, if it is so apparent to their lender that they are qualified or overqualified for a loan, that they're not concerned about the buyers being able to borrow money, they will tell you, yeah, that's okay. Is that risky? Very minorly risky. You can still cancel under any of the other uh, contingency timeframes, but this is something that without, you know, the, the mortgage worker or loan officer has to tell you, oh, this is totally fine. Um, or the buyer, uh, sorry, and the buyer has to be comfortable with it. Okay. I did right one now. of those. Uh huh? Yeah, I did that in one of those uh, because of the buyers were very overly qualified. Yeah, hold on, my doorbells are ringing. My dog for racing around the house looking for BMO. <laughs> BMO, come here. Come here. Okay. Um, let's see. So right now, um, because we're in multiple offers, um, listing agents are concerned about property appraising for the accepted offer price. So it's very common in your counteroffer process, you might see that they're asking you to waive the appraisal contingency, okay? So if your buyer has a loan, that can be very problematic because if the property doesn't appraise for the property value, just to make it easy, let's say a property is worth $100,000, um, but, and we're gonna be extreme here just to illustrate the purposes, but it ends up in escrow after, you know, 30 buyers make offers at 200,000. If the appraisal comes in at 120,000, well, in addition to whatever down payment funds the buyer was putting down on their hundred or their $200,000 purchase, they now have to come in with the $80,000 difference between the agreed upon contract price and the appraised value. Does that make sense? And they do not have contingency protection to cancel the deal. Okay, so they do not have contingency protection because we've waived it as part of the counter offers. And that's, uh, you know, concerning and scary. Um, so I can you waive an appraisal? Absolutely. But, you know, you have to have the conversation with your buyer ahead of time that they're gonna to have to come in with the difference between the appraised value and the uh, contract price, 
unless the seller agrees to reduce price or share that. But the whole point of the listing agent asking a buyer to look their appraisal contingency prior to entering escrow is so the seller does not have to come down on price. Can you do this? Absolutely. Are you still going to have an appraisal? Absolutely. So my workaround for this is to go ahead and lift the appraisal contingency. I do. I just make sure that my physical inspection contingency is a little bit longer so that I have time to cancel underneath the protection of a different contingency if the property doesn't appraise. So in addition to that, I am telling my buyer's lender or mortgage broker, I need you to order the appraisal on day one, like ASAP, because I'm concerned about it appraising and we don't have an appraisal contingency. I need to have this back and know if it appraised prior to the time our physical inspection contingency expires. Okay? Can I so ask, fancy footwork. Can I ask a question regarding that? Yeah. I just lost an offer that could, I was representing the buyer. The, the offers I was, I was competing, they listed all their contingencies. Uh-huh. Um, is there a way around for the buyer to get out once it's, you know, once it's done? Uh, under the, the seller disclosure contingency. If, and here's the thing, like, I think there's probably a recording and uploaded somewhere on YouTube is a truly contingency free offer. You can lift all of your contingencies as the buyer with your offer and it gets accepted. But the second the seller gives you a disclosure after you have an automatic five days in which to review those and cancel. So if the buyer lifts their, their inspection, sorry, if the buyer lifts all their contingencies, but the seller gives them new information like seller disclosures or a report after then, the buyer automatically gets five days in which to review and cancel. They get an automatic like reset for five days of the seller disclosure contingency. Make sense? I forgot about that, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So is that offer truly contingency free? No. <laughs> Did she just bop your head, George? <laughs> um, so yeah, you should probably take the truly contingency free offer class that I teach um, or watch it if it's uploaded to YouTube. Um, let's see. So does everyone understand what no appraisal contingency is and how you can still have protection and cancellation? Because you will be forced into situations where you're going to have to lift it. So then I just have one quick question. Then based on that example, um, mm -hmm. since you still have the inspection contingency, then you should still be okay, correct? Even let's yeah. forget about the seller disclosures. Let's say they submitted that even right off the bat. Yeah. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Now, what I don't recommend is having no loan or appraisal contingency. Remember I told you I like to make my offers uh, without a loan contingency if my buyer is able? Well, I certainly can't do no loan and no appraisal contingency. I have no loan protection then. So it's one or the other guys, not both. So I don't go into something offering no loan contingency. Oh, my animals are playing together. I've only ever seen that like three times in the entire time I've had Nemo. How cute. Wait, is your cat's name Nemo? Uh, my dog's name Bimo, short for Oh, Bimo, like I said Nemo, like So cute. Um, oh, I'm happy to see them playing. Okay, <laughs> let's see here. Um, we talked about appraisal, loan contingency. Um, what else? Obviously a buyer who needs to make a contingent offer, meaning a buyer who needs to sell their property in order to purchase is not gonna be at all competitive in a multiple offer situation, okay? Um, one of the other things you can do is you can offer that the, the buyer pays for some stuff that the seller typically pay for. The, uh, some of the ones that I like to go ahead and have buyer pay for are uh, 7A1 here, the natural hazard zone disclosure report. That's anywhere between like 90 to $130, something like that. I still have the seller choose what company, but the buyer, I might have the buyer pay for it. Retrofitting and building report, I don't recommend that the buyer pays for that. We don't know how much it's going to cost. Okay, uh, same thing, escrow and title, I leave those as they are. Same thing with HOA docs, we don't know how much it's going to cost, so I leave it as a seller cost. 
Um, but I do like to have the buyer waive the home warranty policy. So if you waive it and you check this box, that's up to your buyer, of course. But if it sets their offer apart and gets it accepted, you know, just by waiving something that costs $550 is probably worth it to them. Okay. Seller remaining in possession after close of escrow. If the listing agent said that the seller needs a lease back, um, it may make your offer stronger or it would make your offer stronger to offer that lease back at either less than the buyer's PITI, which means principal, interest, taxes, and insurance. It's the carrying cost of the buyer. So the buyer will be paying those from the date of close of escrow on. Um, so typically the seller, if they're gonna do a lease back, would lease back at the rate of the buyer's actual uh, carrying cost, the PITI. But the buyer could offer to allow the seller to stay there at no cost or a much reduced cost. That would make your offer more uh, attractive if they need a lease back. If they don't need a lease back, it's uh, you know, not, not something you can do. Another quick question. So if they do need a lease back, it's always best to have them at 29 days or less so that there is no landlord tenant relationship. Is that correct? Uh, if you can, sure. But if the seller needs more than 30 days. You're right, gonna... right. I mean, as far as like, you know, that 30 days or less, if it's less than 30 days, then you don't have that. Uh... Tenant relationship created automatically. No, you don't. Okay. Yeah. But in, uh, for the illustration of our purposes today, making your offer more attractive, you're giving the seller the sun, moon, and stars. So if they want 30 days, you're giving them 40 days. And it really doesn't matter what you want because what you're trying to do is get your buyer offer accepted. As long as your buyer is right. right. Yeah. I'm saying, you know, my brother is uh, selling his house and he's in escrow and he may want to extend it a little bit. So I told him... Uh, it's much better if he can try to, I mean, for just basically that if that there is that relationship created, uh, what does he care? Right? He's a if there is more than 30 days. Yeah, he, he shouldn't care. He's a seller, right? He's the one who needs the lease back? Yes, yes. He only care if you were the buyer because you need to get the seller out of there. He's right. the seller, he shouldn't care. Make sense? Nagar? Okay. I gotta go. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Under 14B, this is the buyer's physical inspection contingency, which typically is anywhere from 10 to 17 days in our market. Okay. Uh, maybe it could be less. If you had a condo, maybe it could be seven days. If you have a single family, you need 10, 10 days. But remember, I told you, if you're going to lift the loan or appraisal contingency, you are going to have to find protection under 14B, under the buyer's physical inspection contingency. So it is sort of a, a balance game. If I waive my appraisal contingency, hmm, how many days do I need not to do the inspection, but to get the appraisal back so that if it doesn't come back, I have the protection to cancel under the physical inspection contingency. Does that make sense? The kind of balancing act there? So even if I thought I could do it in seven, seven days, I would probably write 10 days here because it's very unlikely that I'm gonna get an appraisal back and reviewed in less than 10 days. But who would I ask if I needed to check how long I needed? Lender. Yeah, the lender, exactly. Okay. Um, any contingencies you can remove with an offer that makes it more attractive? I think that's pretty much it as far as the contract is concerned. Now, I do want to talk to you guys about what's called an escalation clause, okay? So an escalation clause, does anyone know what that is? Yeah? Okay, so an escalation clause is basically uh, a term in your offer or counter offer that says it's specifically built for a multiple offer situation if you are representing the buyer. And you're gonna have some language that basically says, my buyer will pay 
a certain amount higher than any other higher offer. So let's talk about what the, let's let's talk about a practical example. If there are 10 offers on a property and my buyer wants to use an escalation clause um, and someone comes in, like let's say the highest offer is 550. My escalation clause might say, you know, we will uh, come in, we will pay $5,000 more than any other higher offer. So if the highest um, offer is 500,000, that means my buyer will pay 505,000. Now there is language in that clause that says the ha caps how much my buyer is willing to pay. So my, my buyer come in $5,000 higher than any other offer up to a maximum purchase price of, let's say my client's not willing to pay more than 550,000. So that means that if this, the highest offer that comes in is 545,000. Uh, my buyer could still take it using the escalation clause, but it means that if someone came in at 547, my escalation clause wouldn't apply. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyone it doesn't make sense for, and that's okay. Please don't be shy. Can you, can you repeat Say that? Say it again, please, Christine. I, I missed it. I'm sorry. Yes. So an escalation clause goes and it says you're going to, your buyer will pay an incremental amount that you set in whatever is the language that you write over the highest uh, offer price. So if you're in a multiple offer situation, there are 10 offers, the highest one is 500,000 and your escalation clause says we will pay $5,000 more than the highest offer. That means that your buyer, if the highest offer is 500,000 would be 505. But in your escalation clause, you are also going to have a cap. So yes, my client will pay $5,000 more than the highest offer, but only to a certain amount. You can't come in with an offer at $800,000 and expect my client to pay eight hundred five. They're not going to purchase it at eight hundred five, mm -hmm. right? Right. Okay. $100,000 property. So we're capping it to protect our client, okay? Um, the other thing is in this clause, you have language that says, I want to see proof, basically, of the uh, highest offer. And if you guys bear with me, I will, I have, there's two sets of language that I like. For the escalation clause, if you'll wait a second so I can search my email, I'll actually paste them into the text box for you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You'll, you'll want to keep this. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Some agents, by the way, don't like escalation clauses and you certainly don't want to do an escalation clause for like a thousand, three thousand dollars. It seems kind of silly. Um, sellers and listing agents don't like it. It's kind of a cheap way to beat your competition, right? So when you're doing an escalation clause on a lower end property, I don't recommend an increment of less than five thousand. And on a higher end, I don't really recommend an increment of less than ten thousand. Okay. So this escalation clause is in the doc. This would be in the document. You would put it in the counter offer. Counter offer. Okay. But probably counter offer. So what happens if? So basically, say you have someone and they use the escalation clause and they they add five thousand dollars now more to their property and then someone comes in and they give you more than that, then it's obviously not in. It's not active, right? I mean, sure it is. It's 5,000 more than the higher offer, the highest Yeah, but offer. what if you have someone who comes in and gives a higher offer than your ex escalation clause? You mean the capped rate of the escalation clause? Yes. Then, yeah. then, you, then the listing agent will probably pick up the phone and let you know so you can submit a new counter offer if you wanted to. But yes, your escalation clause would not be in effect. And most likely it doesn't matter because your buyers don't want it. It's exceeded the price, they, the maximum price they're willing to pay. Make sense? Yeah. So they can still submit another one at a higher rate if if someone comes in with a higher rate. If you even know about it and the listing agent tells you and they want to, yes. But at that point, the listing agent and seller may just accept the other higher offer. Okay. Yeah. And you don't have to worry about them countering you because they know you're willing to pay more because they have to show you proof, right? They have to show you proof. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And by proof, what do I like to see? I like to see page one and 10 
of the RPA. And you can put that in here if you wanted to. I just like to keep this language simple because it's a com complex thing. Okay, so let's talk about it. Buyers offer a purchase price of blank dollars higher than any other offer received, not to exceed a total of blank. Seller shall, upon acceptance, provide buyer with complete copy of the highest offer received. Instead of complete copy, you can say um, pages one and 10. But here's the problem, is that there may be counter offers and addendums that might actually affect the desirability of, the, of that offer, that highest offer received. So I do like a complete copy. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. All right. That's it. I don't know any other tricks. I don't know. Make sure that the listing agent likes you. <laughs> Number one key. They will feed yeah. so that they wouldn't feed other people. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's all about how you handle yourself. Yeah. Peaches and cream, guys. Peaches and cream. I, I worked for a really jerk agent. Uh, probably the worst boss I've ever had. I don't know. There are three tied for number one. <laughs> are you on this side? What's that? There are three worst bosses tied for number one. And that boss, he was just a darling. And until the contract or acceptance was signed. Yes. Nagar, can you mute? Oh, I'm so sorry. Thank you. And then the second we got acceptance of our offer, Oh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, he turned into this horrible asshole who oftentimes the listing agent would no longer speak to after their first conversation following acceptance. And uh, I handled it from that point. But, um, you know, that's just a clear illustration of you really need them to like you. So even if they're doing things that aren't quite right, as long as it doesn't affect your offer or your buyer detrimentally, you know, save it. And I have a that you have that you need to work out as long as they're not going to affect the transaction of your client, just save it. What's up? When will you use, when will be the case where you actually will use that, um, bring the DU into the game? I mean, if the listing agent uh, requests it. So a DU okay. is a direct underwriting approval. It's just a secondary level, level of loan approval, but the mortgage broker or lender has to actually do a hard credit inquiry for the buyer to get a DU. So if you're doing that quite often, it can lower the buyer's credit score a little bit, like one or two points each time. So I don't ever provide a DU unless the listing agent is asking me to get one. Got it. Any other questions? Do you have any ideas? Sorry, I have a quick question. Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, so this first transaction that I'm doing with my listing, now we have back and forth with the offers. And I'm doing it myself because Justin wants me to learn everything from zero. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the future, can I use a transaction coordinator for all these? And I will you still have to write the offers or they will do it? I just, I'm a little bit confused. They will not write counter offers or offers. In fact, your transaction coordinator should never write a single document or disclosure for you. They should simply send them out for signatures and keep track of signatures. Okay. Um, you can use Brian Chung in our office for your second deal for transaction coordination if you are a mentee. Okay. Uh, you're welcome. Once you graduate, you can use anyone you want. Um, the reason I say you can use Brian Chung on your second deal and no one else is first off, he's amazing. And if any, anyone who knows me knows I don't give out referrals or praise very lightly. Um, but secondly is because he knows all of our brokerage specific documents, which uh, you know an outside transaction creator is not going to know. And so as a new agent in the mentorship program, um, you're not gonna really be familiar with these documents either. So it has to be Brian Chung if you are a mentee on your second deal. Okay, perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, Kristen. Right. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you. Thank you.